Welcome to today's program, Ken Seeley on Interventions. I'm Gary Enos, editor of Addiction Professional Magazine. Today's program has been sponsored by Foundations Recovery Network. Thank you to them and to you and our audience for giving us your time and attention. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping details. Today's program is interactive. Our speaker will answer questions at the end of the presentation, so please use the Q&A feature on the left-hand side of your screen to submit a question at any time during the presentation. The scale button on the toolbar at the top of your screen scales the presentation to fit your screen. On your left is a box labeled Handouts, where you can download a PDF of the program slides. For those seeking CE credit, you must be registered for today's program to receive credit. During the program, two messages will appear on your screen. If you are participating as an individual, enter the attendance code, which will appear twice on your screen during the presentation, to verify your attendance, as this is required to generate your CE certificate. After the program's completion, please stay in the room, as a link will appear that will allow you to generate your CE certificate. If you are participating as part of a group, write down the two CE codes that will appear on the screen during the program. Those registered for today's event will receive an email following the program, which will provide a link to allow you to verify your registration information and attendance codes to generate your CE certificate. We also invite you in our audience today to share your thoughts. Share about today's presentation via Twitter at the event hashtag interventions. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Ken Seeley. Ken Seeley has remained involved professionally and personally in recovery since 1989. He applies his relevant experience and boundless enthusiasm to profoundly change the lives of people who suffer from the disease of addiction, both the addict and the addict's family and friends. Ken works to save lives every day as the founder of Intervention 911. His organization is one of the most prominent and successful private intervention services in the country. Ken was previously featured on the A&E television series, Intervention. He was recently honored to speak before the British Parliament about the importance of intervention and the continuum of care to help create lasting recovery for those suffering from addiction. Certified as a board-registered interventionist too and registered addiction specialist, Seeley himself has been clean and sober since July 14, 1989. Since then, he has worked full-time in the business of recovery. Today, he still derives the greatest personal satisfaction from the hundreds of interventions he has conducted, organized, or facilitated through Intervention 911. Seeley's remarkable success rate has turned him into one of the most sought-after interventionists in the country. His knowledge and unique perspective have made him the number one go-to expert on the subject of addiction and intervention within the media, where he's a regular contrib contributor for CNN, MSNBC, NBC, CBS, Fox, ABC, and many others. Thank you very much, Ken, for joining us today. And with that, the audience is yours. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate that. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. I mean, it's such an honor to um, be able to work with all of you and um, have you join in on um, what is so, you know, profound in my life on really helping create a rock bottom and help people when they're still in denial from the disease of addiction. And, and it's just an honor to be here today. And I just want to also thank foundations for uh, making this possible, um, for sponsoring this because of the great relationship and working with them for so many years with our intervention company here and, um, and, and just that continuum care, that seamless continuum care. And that's really where I want this to go um, on this presentation is really – you know, having it where, you know, all of us, all of us as working in this field of addiction, um, understand that we, we, nobody in this field could do this alone. And it really takes, you know, working as a team approach in order to reach the masses. And I was fortunate enough um, eight, nine years ago to, um, to understand that mentality of that. It's, it's just not as small as just working in a private practice and I really needed to get it out there and the media really helped spread that message that um, people can get help, um, that they don't have to suffer any longer and there is help out there for people that are suffering 
and most importantly, their parents and their families and their loved ones, their spouses um, that are watching them deteriorate and feeling like they're helpless um, and nothing that they could do. So we, we came up with this, uh, this hour um, format that hopefully we'll be able to, you know, you'll be able to take some information from here and really, you know, strengthen um, the ability to understand how, how it really does benefit in working um, with each other. Um, there's so many people out there that need our help, and, and there's, if everybody out there was uh, doing their job, there wouldn't be enough people if they all came in and asked for help at the same time. So we'll get to that part also um, through this uh, little me uh, this hour. So the first thing I wanted to talk to you is about the seamless continuum care. Um, again, working all together, long-term recovery for people suffering from addiction. You know, the, the challenge that we have is that um, a lot of places that I used to work with about 10, 15 years ago, you know, I would do an intervention and um, the inpatient treatment facility would feel like uh, we got it from here, we don't need any participation from you moving forward. And that was the old model. And now um, the facilities that we work with, and I hope that, you know, you take from this is that it's so important, is that they, they gather the information from, you know, the primary caregiver. A lot of you are primary caregivers yourselves. And they welcome the information from the primary caregiver. They welcome the information from the interventionist. And they welcome the, inf intervention, or the information from the family. And they gather all that information in order to help, you know, treat this patient and get the most out of it during their time inpatient while they're, they're doing that process. And, you know, what are going to be the recommendations? They're able to, you know, when they finish inpatient, 30, 60, 90 days, um, IOP after that, and really carrying that through. And that's really way, where, where I learned is the seamless continuum care is that, that process. You know, you, we got to start from the very beginning where we see the behaviors, and we'll get to that in the next hour, um, where we're, what to look for in the behaviors. And, you know, when the, when the shift changes from abuse to addiction and how we take from there to long-term care and long-term sobriety. So the statistics in, in NIDA, and I'm sure a lot of you have a lot of your own statistics. I don't really want to spend a lot of time on this because I think, you know, most of us working in the industry have a lot of the statistics. But, you know, just from NIDA alone, we just pulled out, you know, how many people relapse, you know, after treatment, um, how many people stay treatment, you know, does 90 days is much more effective. Um, so we gather all this information and we use this. To, to learn ourselves, you know, what, it, what is the best way to really help the, the people with, with the addiction? How do we really give them the, the most tools necessary? And, and following these statistics is really where I gather my information from. So the most important part of this is that I got gathered from NIDA is that every single patient that we work with is completely different. There, it's always really about reassessing, reassessing, reassessing. You know, the addiction is fluid, so everything is changing on a, on a regular basis. So it's really about, you know, having the primary caregiver um, reassessing and, and changing that. Then we go into, you know, the statistics of how many people are suffering from addiction. You know, um, here we have, you know, 23 million from SAMHSA and only 12% of them receive treatment. Again, what I was talking about earlier, you know, we don't have enough people to treat these, the, the people that are out there suffering from the addiction, if, if they were all to come in today. So there really isn't any competition out there, and that's really kind of how I, I run my business and practice is I work closely with the other leading intervention companies out there in the world. and. You know, um, and we learn from each other and we work, you know, dedicated on helping the people out there that are still suffering and, and combined our efforts instead of having trade secrets, I guess is the way, best way to put it. You know, when there's 23 million people out there suffering, there is no reason for trade secrets in this industry. And, and it's been really helpful for me to continue to grow my practice and continue to grow 
um, and helping people with that mentality. Then we go into, you know, the, the statistics of how many people are, you know, in the Daily News, the New York Daily News, where they say how many, how many drugs are out there that are being prescribed in this country alone in 2010, and, and what are we doing about it? You know, how are we helping these people? Um, if you're a, a news junkie like me also, gathering information to, get to, to figure out how to help people, you know, I hear it all the time on different networks where uh, professionals are reporting every 19 minutes um, a young adult or somebody is passing from the, from the opiate abuse, you know, the, the different medications that are being prescribed. So within this hour, three people, that will be three funerals, three people that are dying just in this hour that we're going to spend together this morning. And, you know, how are we as professionals working in this field really going to help you know, those, those families out there that are suffering from it. And, you know, just from my experience, um, and I, I'm sure a lot of you can identify, um, a lot of people that are, are dying in these statistics that the, the 19, every 19 minutes, you know, a lot of them aren't even crossing that, that line from abuse to addiction. Um, they're not even getting into addiction. It's still in the abuse um, stages. And they're just, experimenting and the combination that they're doing is getting them to that level of overdose and and, and death. So um, I feel, in, in my opinion, I feel like it's my responsibility to take that aggressive action because cause of that reason. You know, are we going to sit back and wait for somebody to get in full-blown addiction or to have to suffer so many consequences that could be, you know, um, removed or not have to happen and if, if we're able to create the rock bottom, I guess is a good way to put it. So what I'd like to do is now go over the continuum care. You know, the, the, real, the, the important part of that is the assessment. You know, um, when you get an assessment um, and and you have an assessment of somebody coming in. And, and I think it was at a convention that um, John Southworth, a colleague of mine, was at recently. And some of you may have been at, at the NADAC conference where somebody um, from this, uh, the government was speaking about, you know, there's 23 million, but there's like 66 million that are, you know, need an assessment in order to really determine where they're at and, and crossing that a line from abuse to addiction. So I, th I think the most important part to reach these people is to really create um, a, a, an assessment that we could get out to the general public that they could see if there is, you know, what level of care is really necessary. You know, what, what, do they need an intervention? Do they need detox? Do they need treatment? Um, what, what, where do they really need? Do they need, you know, to get into therapy? What, what is it really necessary for them to, you know, get the help that they need um, through this assessment process? And, and I was excited to hear about that part of it is really focusing on assessing those 66 million and really determining where they, they need to be, you know, where they need to, how can we help them the best? And early detection. I mean, it's, it's with everything else out there, really figuring out a way for early detection through this assessment process. Um, but once it's assessed, where I'm getting called in is from a lot of clinicians um, contact me, um, primary caregivers, a lot of treatment providers contact me. Um, like I said, I, we work very closely with foundations um, um, and and the work that they do in their inpatient. So through that assessment process, and a uh, patient is, is so far in denial that um, they need to be intervened on, that's, that's where I normally step in. And then for me, where, you know, I would normally, and if it's coming into my private practice and I don't have uh, a primary caregiver, um, sending them into me, or if I don't have, you know, the detox unit or the treatment center referring into me, then we determine where we need to send that patient for that next level of care. And really having as much information about all these different levels of care for this continuum package 
is really important for me in my practice. So, you know, where's going to be the best detox? Where's the best treatment for this individual? Where's, you know, um, intensive outpatient, case management, care planning? This is a big one that we're going to be talking about, um, I think is really a positive um, that we've learned about in the, in, in the years passing, and, and I'll show you how we've learned it. Um, in the next hour also, and how we're using that in our private practices, and, and hopefully that you would also be able to use it in yours. Um, then we have some people that need that higher structure, um, higher level of care after they finish 30, 60, 90 days of inpatient treatment that may need to go to a sober living. Um, some people may not be able to have to go to a sober living, so they need to go back home, so we use sober companions to get them stable in their home environment, you know, definitely some form of therapy. Um, some may need medication through a psychiatrist, 12-step uh, meetings, and, and, you know, gym, stuff like that, other health and wellness of, of getting them into recovery. What we do, um, so going back here for a second, um, with that continuum care um, outline, when we do get an intervention, and the person is not willing. Um, I'll talk about it in a little bit about the high licensed professionals, the doctors, the lawyers, the pilots, pharmacists, nurses, um, their diversion programs. But you know, they they have um, a motivator. They have a consequence that means something to them. That's going to get them to want to be in recovery. When a family member comes to me and they say, you know, oh, my, my spouse will not go to treatment. There's nothing I could do. They've been through treatment before. They think they know it all. Um, what, what is going to be the motivator for them? What is going to be the, the thing that's going to get them to that point of surrender that, you know, everyone has to get to in order to even seek treatment? And even as a primary caregiver, if you're not working at a treatment center and you're a therapist, um, my experience has also been that nobody shows up at the door um, because everything is fine in their life. You know, something devastating, something uncomfortable has happened where they come and seek therapy. And that's where, you know, working in this industry and working with families and asking, you know, digging deep with um, therapists out there, what is it that, you know, treatment centers, what is it that makes us, you know, a self-admit versus uh, um, uh, an intervention client? What is the difference there? And what is a rock bottom? You know, they all talk about this rock bottom that everybody has to hit in order to really surrender to the treatment process. And everybody said, well, you know, a lot of my colleagues would say, you know, everybody's rock bottom is different. It's like a thumbprint. Nobody's is identical. Um, what really has to happen is you'll know it when they hit it. And that wasn't working for me um, because I can't go and tell my families that they'll hit it when they're hit it because that's the natural progression of the disease. And are we going to wait, especially with those statistics that we just talked about, are we going to wait when um, people are dying every 20, 19 minutes from this opiate abuse? Are we going to sit back and turn a blind eye or and wait for the natural progression, not a blind eye, but just not, you know, jump in and do something aggressively, or is there something that we could do? And what we came up with about 10 years ago was this, um, this thing just to help uh, uh, identify what a rock bottom is. And um, I'm sure a lot of uh, your patients have, you know, come to you when some of these things may or may not ha have happened, but, and if there's anything that you could add to that, please email me. I'm always interested in learning more. But um, this is what I've gathered in the past 10 years, that it's some of these things that happen regarding their health. You know, the, the whole thing, it spells out helps. Um, their health, the environment, the emotional rock bottom, a legal rock bottom, personal finances, how they keep their addiction alive, and then a spiritual rock bottom. So I'll just go over them. The first one is a health rock bottom. 
you know, you have somebody that has coded in the emergency room and they go out and they use again because they still haven't hit that rock bottom. Um, you, you have somebody that is, um, that, you know, has liver disease, they have abscesses, they have um, all different things, psychiatric, you know, with, the, with this bath salts. If I don't know if you, a lot of you are dealing with that right now, but we are. We're seeing a lot of bath salts, and they go into, you know, um, they go into a psychiatric disorder where they are, you know, um, pretty much out of it. I mean, they go right into a crystal meth psychosis, um, and it happens a lot faster than it would normally take for my clients that I work with that, that do go into a crystal meth psychosis. The bath salts are, are reaching that a lot faster. So there's a, a disorder there, memory loss, there's all kinds of stuff. And some people, you know, the way I always like to measure this for me personally is some people will, um, they will, you know, if there's four stages, like the four stages of cancer with, with addiction, I, if, if something like this happens and they say, you know, um, their doctor tells them, you know, your, your liver is going out and you, you're coming jaundice and you need to, you know, seek treatment, you know, that would be more of like level, you know, the level number one or that would be, you know, stage number one um, for that disease. They're, they're going to seek treatment. They don't need any other help. They're gonna, they see that they're, these things are happening in their life and they're not as far gone as some people need to go in the disease before they get to that level of surrender. So a health one is normally not when I get called in. You know, I normally don't get called in when, um, you know, th th these things happen, even though it is pretty devastating. The families, you know, unless if it is coding in the emergency room, you know, the families normally don't call me in for a professional intervention, but it is one that some people do seek treatment. The environment, you know, this has been a, a great one for, you know, where we step in. And the environment for me is the family system. Um, when the family system steps in and they choose to change their behaviors to get a different result, so I'll have a spouse say, I'm going to, you know, consider, consider legal separation if you do not get help. Um, it starts tearing apart the kids. The, you know, you got to protect the kids, so we got to, you know, get them away from the kids. When there's some kind of, you know, environmental, the, the family support um, that shows them when they start getting healthier and choose to make healthier choices, um, that the, the, the environment doesn't support the disease anymore. And that's really the, the key compulsion in their emotions, you know, sharing how the addiction, how the disease is affecting their lives in the most loving and, re and supporting way is really the key component of a, a professional intervention for me. You know, th this is the one that I kind of focus on, on creating that rock bottom for, for that person to hit in order to get them to surrender and go to treatment. Then we go into a legal rock bottom. Many, many, many people in this country get help through the legal system. Um, you know, we have the, the drug court programs. I mean, I speak at many different uh, graduations at the drug court programs throughout the country, and um, they are pretty successful. I mean, they, they really, you know, they, they, the legal system jumps in, and instead of facing a felony, um, they're able to go into a drug court program, and unfortunately, because of the finances, I'm sure a lot of you know maybe more that, than this than I do, because uh, working in the field with them, you know, the, the finances aren't there to continue to keep a lot of them open, but the success rate was amazing. I mean, 60, 70 percent are, are the records that I'm getting, the reports I'm getting on how successful the legal system is on creating a rock bottom. And um, sometimes we, we're not there, but a lot of the families that I work with, there's things that they have done that have, you know, laws that they have broken, but they've covered up and helped to bury in or, because they are part of the family system. But, you know, we work with the families to say, you know, maybe this isn't the healthiest choice if they're not going to choose treatment. 
if we went through the family component of, you know, the family cutting them off and that's not going to work, maybe we need to get to that legal, you know, component in order to, to create that rock bottom. Then we go into a personal finance, and that is, you know, for so many addicts, it's so many different things. I mean, a personal finance, is it the job that's, you know, keeping them employed? Um, is it the family that's supporting them financially? Is it, you know, what is it that's, that's keeping the addiction alive? Um, there, there's something that has to finance the addiction. How are they, you know, how are they keeping it going? Um, and again, a lot of the people end up breaking laws in order to, you know, keep their addiction, especially these young adults, um, stealing and different things that they have to do in order, drug dealing, in order to keep their addiction alive. And all of these, again, if you, if you gather all this information through the family system, this is how I help them create a rock bottom. This is part of the, the, the pre-intervention that's, you know, for me, when I do a pre-intervention, it could, the minimum it takes four hours because to gather all of this information from them um, takes some time and then how to implement it. How are you going to present it the day of the intervention? You know, you're not going to go from zero to 80 and say, you know, I'm going to divorce you and we're calling the police and having you arrested. That's, that's not effective. That's not going to, that's going to add fuel to the fire. That's, you know, so you need to create a step ladder approach on how to, you know, present each and every one of them and really help them grasp their mind around it of what that really is going to look like for them. And so, you know, we create the, per, you know, the, Personal finances is a huge one. You know, I, I've had employers where they say, we are no longer going to allow you to, you know, and a lot of the doctor diversion programs, that's what it is. They're licensing, the licensing board holding them accountable um, that they will lose their license. And that's why they're so effective is because there's a consequence that means something. That's their livelihood. That's how they support themselves. That's what they studied for. So, you know, if they don't have a licensing board, then we got to figure out, you know, a lot of employers have drug, uh, drug testing comp or components in their company. So there's lots of different ways to approach that. And, it's, uh, again, everyone is case by case. And then the last one is a spiritual rock bottom. You know, um, every single person that I know of, you know, again, being in recovery myself, that gets long-term recovery – has hit some form of a spiritual rock bottom, and in order to continue that path, they, they hit that. But unfortunately, regarding the health, what's that? Oh, sounds up, sorry. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? <laughs> so anyway, we were, I apologize for that. Um, we're on a spiritual rock bottom. And regarding a spiritual rock bottom, and thank you very much. Um, regarding a spiritual rock bottom and the first going back to the, the um, all of them, the spiritual rock bottom, the first one, and uh, regarding the health, unfortunately, there's nothing we could do in order to create, you know, any of them to excel or to, you know, produce those or to enhance those. Um, they, they're all through the natural progression of the disease. Those, those two happen, and the natural progression of recovery through the spiritual process but, you know, on the environment, the emotional, the legal, the personal finances, absolutely, we totally have um, a, uh, access through the family system in order to help them create that. And, and that's what we do in that pre-intervention, you know, that four to eight hours. You know, I've even had them go as long as 10 hours. You know, that, that pre-intervention is the, the most important part 
of my intervention. It's really educating the family system because what they really need to be, the family system, when I start working with them is like the licensing board or like the, the judge in the drug courts. They need to have a, um, a healthy behavior or a healthy consequence like the drug courts. If you do not participate in the drug court, the consequence is you go back and face the felon. If you do not participate in the diversion programs, the consequence is you will go back and uh, possibly lose your license. So, so be, the family needs to be that licensing board. That's really what my job is as an interventionist, is really help them and educate them on how they become that licensing board and how to keep that, uh, that, that consistent. I mean, it, the, the drug courts are a year and a half long, most programs. So there's a consistency there to keep them motivated, to keep them in the recovery process. There's a consistency there with the, light, the, the um, high, high license professionals. Then we go into when to intervene. You know, we always look at, you know, for us, when, when a family members call us and ask us, when is a good time to intervene? You know, we always just like to say when the behaviors, the attitude, the achievement, the attendance, when these things start changing, that's the best time to intervene. You know, it's an easy way to assist, assess, you know, when to intervene. You know, is it time to, you know, take that aggressive approach? Because, you know, it is, it is scary for the families to have to, you know, move forward with a professional intervention. But, you know, in my experience is, is if we don't and we continue to, you know, wait, um, especially with these young adults and especially with the statistics out there of every 19 minutes, you know, what are we waiting for? So I would rather get them, you know, do this intervention, educate them on how they are become the licensing board, help them understand how to, you know, present or to prevent ending up in the emergency room or ending up in jail, you know, or worse, ending up dying from this. How, how, can, we get, how can we raise that rock bottom before it has to go down that low? It really doesn't have to. You know, there's things out there in today's, you know, medicine out there and, and all that we know as professionals working in this field, there really isn't a, a need to go down that low with this disease. There's, there's signs that we could look for, the behaviors, the attitude, you know, are they still, you know, getting the grades that they normally get? Are they still showing up at the family program or at the family events? You know, there's things that we could look for. And if not, again, inpatient may not be what's necessary for these people. It may only be intensive outpatient. But, you know, intervene. the early detection is the most important part. So then we go into um, case management and the continuum of intervention and treatment. Um, you know, this we started doing about five years ago in our company because what we realized is, you know, a lot of their treatment providers out there, you know, like the Salvation Army, you know, six months, you know, long. A lot of people know that, you know, if you have to hit that low of a rock bottom, um, they, they have programs that are six months. They have young adult programs because, um, that are, could be up to a year long. So, you know, that continuum level of care is so important. And, and we saw that people were relapsing at a, at a high rate after the intervention and inpatient. So we, we figured out, you know, what's next, you know. And that's why intensive outpatient has been such a great asset through this process. And, and we're all growing with this. We're all learning with the uh, continuum care, you know, what we did is, you know, what we're doing, and, you know, and I hope this is something that a lot of you are already doing um, and know of, is to really, you know, figure out what the high license professionals and the drug courts, what is their um, model? You know, what is, what is their, their protocol in order to get the higher level of success? Like I said, the, the drug court programs, I hear they have a 70% success rate, you know, um, I know United Airlines, I was with somebody at a conference recently, and he um, ran the United Airlines 
um, program, and he said they have a 95% success rate with their diversion program. So what is a diversion program? What are the components? You know, if, if somebody that they see may or may not have a, you know, may have a drug or alcohol program, if they're not willing to seek treatment themselves, they conduct a professional intervention. Um, they do 90 days of inpatient treatment. They get assigned an ongoing case manager. Um, they do random drug testing. Um, they call in a phone number every day, Monday through Friday, and they, if it's their day to test, they go into the local lab. Um, and then they have the motivator, and I think that's the key component. They have a motivator. They have the leverage. They have what is really keeping them engaged through this process. <clears throat> so I, I talked a little bit about the, the drug courts. Um, these are some of the statistics that we were able to get from um, the Southworth Association's um, John Southworth program and the doctor there that is um, working with them on, you know, 28 years, um, Dr. Uh, Greg Skipper, he's holding these statistics with them um, that out of all their medical professionals that they, they work with, um, they're getting, you know, these statistics, 96 um, percent of them retain their license, you know, 79 percent of them are abstinent after 7.2 years. I mean, these are amazing statistics. And if we go back to how that is happening, this is the, the, this is the protocol that they're following in order to get these statistics. So if they're following this easy protocol, we should all be following this easy, this protocol. I mean, it's, it's been working. I had somebody speak at a meeting for me with 28 years recovery and he was, he's, a medic, he's a doctor out of Miami and the medical board intervened on him 28 years ago and he went through the doctor diversion program and he's still clean and sober and working, you know, and, and living a successful life, but it was all because of this, this, this protocol right here. This is, this is the recipe they used. Oh, sorry, not that one. Here we are. <laughs> This is the recipe they used for, to making that happen. So um, these are the statistics they're getting, um, and it, it, and there's also no evidence of patient harm through this process. So it's a it's an amazing protocol. It's an amazing program. We have you know adopted this program in our 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 private practice. And we've been doing it for the last five years, and it's been a huge success. And what we've realized is, you know, the, the drug courts do it for, I think, 18 months, most states, if they're still doing it. Um, the the um, doctor diversion programs, if they're still open, I mean, uh, it's just heartbreaking to watch how 28 years ago they see it was successful and they're not having the resources to continue a lot of the states. But... You know, um, there, there's this, it was three years when it started, and then it went up to five years, and a lot of you probably know more about each of state that you're in. Um, and then the United Airlines program is a 10-year protocol, but what we're realizing is with the private sector, with the families, um, when we educate the families, when we get the families on this, you know, on board with this process, it's normally only taking 12 months. One year, they're able to continue to have that, that, um, that the, they're, continue, they're able to continue with the mindset that, they, that this consequence, and I, I, I hate to use the word consequence, but with the consequential thinking, with the, you know, licensing board, with the, you know, the drug diversion programs and their freedom, you know, to go back and, and serve time, those are their consequences. So when the family sees that these consequences have to stay consistent, because what we've real what we've seen is that you know that the the patient, the person, is starting to look better. They're starting to feel better, and they're starting to dictate what their treatment is going to look like. And they're not going to follow their primary therapist, you know, recommendations anymore. But if we're able to work with the family system that you know, they're able to work together as a team, they will follow the primary therapist's recommendations. They will continue through this, this uh, protocol 
that we ask um, them to follow. And where we go with that is where I get a lot of, you know, um, questions from, you know, the callers, the families, the people that we work with. Well, you know, my loved one isn't a high-licensed professional. My loved one isn't uh, uh, in drug court or a felon. You know, how do we create those motivators? And um, what I like to do is, you know, again, I go back to to where we were over here and help them identify this. And, you know, again, it takes hours. We go through every single one of these and figure out how can we make it um, – enough discomfort to get them to be motivated? What what can we do to make them feel, um, you know, and, and stay at that level to make them want to, to be motivated to change and to be a willing participant when they're in your office as a therapist? You know, what, how are you going to get them motivated? And what, what I've seen is getting the family system on board, creating some kind of, consequence to motivate them and again it, it doesn't really work well when we're dealing with you know when we're we're working with family members that um, you know when we're working with therapists that they have to come in and be the interventionist and the therapist you know I really feel like it's important that we each have our own role and work as a treatment team approach so we we work with the family members we we work with them on how to, you know, through the helps, identifying what the rock bottom is going to be. And the key component is that they are consistent. If there's nothing else that you could take from this is, you know, is really that's the hardest challenge I have with families is keeping them to be consistent because after 30, 60, 90 days and they get home and they seem to be better, you know, the again, we're not going to go from zero to 80 and because you didn't go to a 12-step meeting or you didn't show up at your therapist, I'm going to, you know, serve you with divorce papers. Of course not. But there needs to be some form of accountability. There needs to be some form of a consequence in order to get them back to reengaged. So, you know, case management level number one is, you know, is, is what well, what we've been doing is is really just about the monitoring, the urine testing, the meeting slips, and the monthly and quarterly reports on, you know, this is what I believe that the, the insurance company should start paying for this for everyone. For 12 months after they leave treatment, everybody should be, and a lot of the treatment facilities out there today are starting to do this. I know... Um, when they leave and they stay in 90 days of treatment or, you know, uh, or longer, they're adding this, this component in that process. And what of it, one of it is is that, you know, they are randomly tested, just like a doctor. Monday through Friday, they pick up that phone as they get up and start their day. They call in as if it's their testing day. They drop down, they give a, a, a sample, and they every meeting that they attend, whatever that's in their uh, contract or agreement for continuum care from the treatment provider, um, how many 12-step meetings, how many psychiatry, whatever meetings are, are prescribed, they just have that meeting slip to bring back and show the monitoring company that they are participating at the level that they should. Um, this one, again, everybody should have this. I, I believe that every single people or every single person that, you know, suffers from addiction should have this available to them because um, it's really another component of just one more level of accountability. Um, and what I'm seeing is a lot of the patients are wanting this. A lot of them are saying, hey, I could have something, uh, an insurance policy almost on my recovery after I put so much into this, you know, something that's going to just keep me accountable through this process because if they do test positive, there's a contract that they put into place that, you know, what, what, what will be next. The level number two is a little bit more aggressive on, um, on what, what would be part of that continuum care process. You know, they do the intervention, they go in, inpatient for 30 days, they go 90 days, whatever that's going to take, they go to intensive outpatient, 
they go to sober living, they go whatever that process is. When all of that is said and done and they're kind of left to their own devices, <coughs> we like to get, again, just like the high license professionals have been doing for years, their case management. You know, so what that includes is the same as level number one. They will do their urine testing, their meeting slips, um, monthly and quarterly reports. But this part is, um, is more of somebody that will work with the family system. And a case manager really isn't um, dictating treatment whatsoever or prescribing anything. Their main job is to gather the information. It's like a, a, a hub of a wheel. They are gathering all the information from the primary therapist, from the family system. Some of the people will allow them to, you know, to talk to their sponsors in their 12-step program. And again, not to know what's in their four-step or know what they're doing, but just are they yes or no being compliant? Are they going to their meetings? Are they working with you on their steps? A yes or no question. They're, they stay in contact with the drug testing company. They, they gather, you know, are they taking their, their medication um, through the, their psychiatrist? So they're, they're more of the hub. And whenever there's a red flag in the family system or they're not showing up for their therapy appointment or they haven't talked to their sponsor, they're able to go to the rest of the, the spokes of the wheel and they're able to communicate with each and every one of them and see if, you know, there's a problem, if there's any red flags, what's happening in their lives. And with that protocol, again, the doctor diversion programs are assigned these kind of case managers that they're able to check with everybody and make sure that they're just being compliant with their program of recovery that is prescribed from their primary caregiver. So that one's a lot more um, aggressive and, and really pulling together. And, and again, with this one, we're able to use the family system as the licensing board or the judge in the drug court programs. We're able to help them really stay on track because what my experience has been is that the families, again, they, they lose the, the urgency. The crisis isn't there anymore. So they, they kind of fall off and kind of let them dictate their own treatment. Again, we never judge or we never, you know, uh, recommend, but we just point out that if they're not following their primary, you know, caregiver's recommendations, this has been our experience. And again, normally after they end up having to fall again, at least they have a, a place that they're able to come back that's a loving, supporting system that they could come back and get them the help quicker than waiting for, you know, if they go 12 months without that form of accountability, they're, they're going further into their disease and the addiction. But if there's somebody there working with them for that 12, that first initial 12 months, and once they see the consistency of that, that um, bottom line that they, they created, you know, only, I mean, I would say three to five percent of the people that we work with even need to go into year two. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's amazing that, you know, we, we have those type of statistics that we don't have to go three to five to ten years of accountability when the family system changes. And part of working with the family is uh, uh, most, one of our most difficult parts, but it is, you know, you know, suggested to the families is them getting involved in their Al-Anon programs and them getting, if they need a higher level of care, them going to a treatment center for inpatient treatment, going to getting some care with um, facilities on, on codependency. So that's part of also helping them. And once we walk through that process, you know, we're really able to see the benefits of, of the case management. So where we see it being beneficial for primary caregivers is that the therapist, you know, only has to make one call. If they're seeing abnormal behaviors, they could have uh, regular uh, feedback back from how the rest of the system is going through email or phone calls or whatever they're, whatever they're asking for, whatever they need, you know, and, uh, and, and keeping that in mind with, you know, if there is a relapse and they need to come back to treatment, we're able to get them back to treatment. And I always like to recommend, I would say, 90% of the time that they go back to the original treatment provider because they already have a relationship with them and they know where they're at. 
instead of starting fresh with, you know, uh, a new program, it really makes it easier for that continuum level of care. So, so really the case management and, and working with treatment providers, it just makes it where, you know, we're able to follow your recommendations. We're able to follow out what you're, you're wanting for that, that patient. And again, as we all know, addiction is very fluid. We, you know, we never, we, it's always changing. So we need to have somebody monitoring the, the whole system as, nor, as, quick, as quickly as possible. Then we go into the case management. You know, these are the benefits, again, what we see um, for the facility. And now we go into any questions that you may have um, regarding this process and um, anything that you may have to add to that you have seen that has used would be more than welcome at this point and has been successful. Ken, thank you very much. Uh, terrific presentation. Uh, we do have some questions that have come in and also just want to remind all participants that if you do have a question that you have not yet submitted and would like to, you can still use the Q&A feature on the left-hand side of your screen to submit a question. We'll try to get through as many as we can in the uh, remaining minutes here. Ken, a question came in from a staff member with a VA uh, facility. said, many of our clients no longer have family relationships due to their chronic use. What might be the motivator when family is not in the picture. Yeah, that, that's one of the most devastating, you know, um, parts. I mean, it's like with the high license professionals, they have the licensing board. With the drug courts, when they get involved in a drug court, if, if my recommendations would be in, with the VA, if they don't have the family system, you know, a lot of them may have um, – committed some crimes that would qualify them to get into a drug court program. If they have gone to that extent, I would encourage them, you know, the VA, uh, if they have the staffing, I don't even know if they have the, you know, the manpower behind them to do this, but to get the, you know, instead of going down and facing a felony to, you know, to really look into having um, them to get involved in the drug court program because that will give them the, the, the formula, the, the, the stuff necessary that's, that we're seeing that's helping people get in. And then I've also, you know, worked with people, and, and again, when, when it's heartbreaking, when they're homeless in the streets and they have nobody and they're, they're struggling, sometimes there's, there's one friend that may be able to pull in some people that mean something to them, but that... that those are the, the most heartbreaking people in the world to have to try to help because, like you said, when you look at the HELPS model, when you look at the, the how to create a rock bottom, there isn't much there, you know, and, it, and it's unfortunate, but the only thing that I've seen happen is either a friend jumps in to try to help because I've conducted a professional intervention with only one person, you know, one friend being there. The rest of the family cut all ties. They wanted nothing to do with the addict. So one friend called me in and I conducted the intervention and we created that rock bottom together. But if they don't have that one friend, they don't have a family, you know, the only other thing that I've seen create that rock bottom is a drug court program. So that, that is heartbreaking and I'm sorry that you're having to deal with that. Good suggestions, Ken. A uh, question that came in about youth treatment. Um, what do you think uh, works well for youth who are substance dependent and incarcerated? At what point in a predetermined sentence for a juvenile would alcohol and drug treatment possibly be effective? Um, I, from where, when I, I deal with a lot of that, with the youth that... Um, get in trouble with the laws and they, um, they, we normally work with the court system and um, asking them for inpatient treatment um, to be released under the care of a primary caregiver with a facility and then some form of structured um, living after that. Um, and, and that's where we we're able to see the statistics because when you see the, um, you know, the people that are in jail and concentrated because of the, you know, their behaviors of their addiction, 
you know, um, it's really not helpful. <clears throat> so I, I, I believe that if we could get them into inpatient treatment, you know, um, there's a lot of places out there. You know, I, I work with some facilities that do free treatment. You know, some PACs have insurance-based treatment. So finding an inpatient treatment that we could transport them to and, and get them into some kind of care versus continuing on their addiction. We had a couple of questions, Ken, about access to uh, interventionists uh, in general. Uh, one question that just came in, uh, what would you recommend for therapists who work in rural areas where interventionists may not be working in close proximity? Um, well, that's what I would do is contact an intervention company. There's a lot of companies out there because then they end up having uh, different interventionists all over the country. And... Um, they could they could work with them in most places that you know that we work with most people that we work with that, through the intervention company is we don't normally keep them in their area for primary care so if we need to do an intervention we could take an interventionist that's close you know as I, as I said again thank you uh, foundations and 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 putting this on today but. As an example, um, we would have an interventionist that's close to, you know, um, Palm Springs where they would fly out to that royal, royal area, do, conduct the intervention with the family, you know, uh, system. And I love it. If there is a primary therapist to be there to support the addict through this process because we want the primary caregiver to have that, continue that bond with them. So it's more of this is a meeting, this is a, 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 and I hate the word of intervention. I wish we could change it because it, it's so fearful for everybody, the family. The, the, but if we could have a meeting, a family meeting where they have their support, they have their ally, their primary caregiver, the family system has the interventionist there to say, hey, we, we have chosen not to sit back and turn a blind eye. We're hoping you take this gift of recovery and then that interventionist flies them to a treatment provider. And then the, the most important part I hope all of you could take from this today is about really working together as a team. Because as a primary caregiver, you know, you need to trust your interventionist that they're going to bring back the information to you. You need to trust the treatment center that they're going to bring back the information to you. And then you're going to need to, you know, be able to continue that continuum level of care because there is no fast fix for this disease. It's a process. It's three to five years. You know, the statistics are after five years, that's where people start gaining the, the long-term recovery. So three to five years, they need to be with some kind of therapy or working some kind of program. So really work with a program that will have, you know, know that they have to work as a team. And, and that's a lot of all the foundation properties that I've ever worked with have always had that and, and appreciate that because we're always an open book on how to better help the patient. And, the, and give the primary, you know, the therapist all the information they need to continue in that care. We'll, we'll plan to get through a couple more questions here. Um, uh, this one also can relate to access to intervention services from a slightly different perspective. Uh, the person asks, uh, I am concluding my master's degree in counseling and notice that we have no active interventionist in our area. Uh, the state that he's from does not require any licensure to be an interventionist, and he wanted to know what education is required for certification and where do I obtain it? Great question. And everybody that you look for, make sure the only thing that's out there right now, I'm on the board of AIS, Association of Interventionist Specialists, and we meet three times a year. The board meets once and the, the membership meets three times a year. Um, it's a great thing to get involved in if you're interested in being an interventionist um, as a member and then also every, all the members um, retain their board registry. So if you Google board registered interventionist, there's a credential there and we're, this, this week we're putting a test together on um, getting a certification for interventionists. But right now the only um, board that, the only thing we have right now is board registered interventionist. 
Excellent. And then we're going to wrap up with this question uh, on the rock bottom concept, uh, again, dealing with young people. We have a, a, a participant who asks, uh, Ken, does the rock bottom model work with younger adolescents, with those at the you know younger end of the spectrum? Yeah, the rock bottom um, concept, totally, I mean, that's my favorite part to work with is adolescents or young adults because, you know, I, I, my experience has been that with young adults and um, adolescents, you really have to give them long-term care. You know, they don't have the life experiences under their belt of how the addiction has affected them, so long-term care is really the most important part of, of really helping them, you know, get that, that treatment necessary. So creating the rock bottom with the HELPS model is really effective because the family holds all of the consequences you know, you don't have to wait for them to get in legal trouble. You don't have to wait to they, you know, to get to that that rock bottom of ending up in the emergency room. The family system can create that, and the earlier you do it, from what I'm learning, is the the, the better results we're getting. You know, start earlier. We have people that are doing it at 15 years old. We have people that are getting addicted at 13 years old. So if we're able to reach them in these earlier stages of the, of the disease, they're able to have a longer, healthier, successful life. Very good, Ken. We're going to wrap up the Q&A portion now. And, and just to uh, share with participants, uh, for more information about upcoming addiction professional webinars, please visit us at www.addictionpro.com and click the webinars link. Also, please feel free to join our online communities on Facebook and LinkedIn to share and participate in the discussion with the addiction professional community. We have some final notes regarding CE credit. Those who have viewed today's presentation as individuals and want to obtain credit, stay online and logged in. A link will appear on your screen in a few minutes, and it will allow you to generate your CE certificate for the event. For those viewing as a group who want to obtain CE credit, note that anyone registered for the event will receive a follow-up email that will provide a link to verify your registration information and the event CE code to generate your certificate. Should you have any questions regarding CE certificates, please contact the CE Help Desk at the number listed here. Also, this program will be archived for one year for your convenience and for sharing with colleagues. Within the next few days, you will receive an email with a link that will allow you to download the presentation slides and view a recording of today's event. I want to again thank Ken Seeley for, make, for taking the time to speak with us today and also thank Foundations Recovery Network for making today's program possible. Finally, thank you to everyone in our audience for participating. We hope you'll join us in the future for another Addiction Professional webinar. This concludes today's presentation.